Good evening. I'm going to show that again. Good evening. Oh, thank you. Now I know you can hear me. Um, my name is Carol Rady, and it's my pleasure to work in the library as the library events manager. And I wanted to welcome you all here tonight and uh, state that in the program, there are two things I need to mention. First of all, um, sadly, Mariah Bain cannot join us tonight. She's had a death in the family um, this morning. And so she, she will hopefully be a participant in the future. And the order that the speakers appear in your program is not the order that they will be speaking in. So that is purposely to keep you on your toes. <laughs> How am I doing? Okay. I have help on the program from two students. Um, could you wave and... Yeah. Two students from a class, and I've already forgotten their names, although it hasn't been very long, so um, their names are on the back of the program, and it's just great to have a program, and thank you very much. And um, I'm now going to turn the program over to Lynn Mitchell Parrish, who was a speaker last year and can speak for herself. She is our MC. and assets for information technology services here. This is a magical event, and when you think magic and just a little bit of whimsy, you naturally think IT. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're welcome. So, uh, I first want to uh, apologize. I'm, I'm wrestling with a cold, and we uh, sometimes I'm winning and sometimes I'm not. So uh, by the power of mucinex ingested in me, I am uh, I'm here uh, today to be with you. But I honestly wouldn't miss it uh, for anything. I was privileged to be a speaker uh, last year, and so I begged them, please let me come back in some capacity. I'll stand in the corner and just give me a microphone, please. And uh, so I'm very pleased to be able to be your uh, MC tonight. Um, so I'm very passionate about this event, but none of us would be here without the passion of the uh, library mentors, uh, special events, uh, Carol. Ravy. So let's give a big round of applause for Carol. Um, uh, it's, we're grateful for Carol's vision and for seeing it all the way through to have us here uh, again tonight. And we're grateful too for the rest of the brilliant behind the scenes library crew who uh, makes this possible. And that's uh, John Jackson, who's head of outreach and communications, and Jay Hazlett in uh, I'm gonna get this right, collections and uh, development and evaluations. Yeah, all right. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Stephanie. Writes uh, in charge of library systems and is our timekeeper tonight uh, to make sure that I don't talk for an hour and a half solid. So let's give it up for, for those people who work very hard. On this. <laughs> and we have two students here in the in the lineup of speakers, and that is due to the efforts of Henry Ward, who is the director of uh, intercultural advancement and student affairs here. So he can be here tonight. Uh, I'm told so. I did want to acknowledge him and, and give a round of applause for Henry Ward. <laughs> students join this event truly makes it extra special and that all groups are represented. We have students, we have faculty, we have staff, we have a, a fact staff hybrid. So uh, we have we have simply thought of everything tonight. So, so it's really nice. It's gonna be a great night. I'm excited. So if we could please give a big round of applause for the for the four speakers who are here and have, have given their bravery to give their, their stories tonight. <laughs> given a common theme, and uh, last year's theme was uh, the fork in the road. And so there's just enough specific to, to give you direction to shape your story, but still wide open on where you want to take it. And so how we arrived at this year's theme was actually a funny little story in and of itself, I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, so we were in this really uh, power lunch meeting of uh, just epic proportions, just brainstorming and trying to come up with themes. It's, it's really, it's like that legendary Pixar lunch of 1994, they remember that one where in that they came up with the four major films uh, saying what if, what if, uh, you know, we followed the life of a bug and we got Bugs Life and what if we, you know, the, figure out what toys did when we weren't around, we got Toy Story, what if there's a little fish in a big ocean, oh, Finding Nemo, and what if uh, mankind had to leave Earth and leave a little robot behind, Wally, 
So <laughs> just because of one lunch meeting and because people were saying, what if, without restriction. And our meeting was exactly like that. <laughs> it, it really was. And so I hope you continue to come back year after year because we have so many themes just lined up in the wings that are going to be so awesome. Uh, but while we were talking, the, we were down in the cafe here, the TV was on in the background, and it was, it was low volume, the visuals were rather loud, so we kind of kept looking over, and there was a, a the lower thirds banner stayed across a press conference going off the rails. Now, I'm not going to tell you whose press conference that was, or what um, political figure might have been making word type sounds out of his speak hole at the time. Again, I'm not going to say who it was, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. But eventually, we, uh, we looked up, and I think it was Jamie, who said, hey, hey guys, what if... And so we're very proud to bring you our second installment of Love New Speaks, Off the Rails, Stories of Resilience, Bravery, and the Time When Everything Went Wrong. So, uh, it was and again, that just gives you the direction, but the speeches can go wherever they go, just, just hold on to that common theme. And really, there's no other rules other than time. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's nice. Um, so, the art of storytelling has been going on for thousands of years, like forever. We, we tell stories our whole lives. When we're little, we tell stories to get out of things. When we're a little bit older, we tell stories to get into things. And when we're even older still, we start telling stories to make sense of things and to document things, remember things. My keys were just right here. I know I came back from the grocery store. It was around five. There was a chill in the air. It was a bit brisk. <laughs> but, you know what I mean. So the themes can take on any, uh, any, any, any sort of uh, vibe. Uh, they could be lighthearted and, and amusing. It could be courageous and inspirational. It could be deeply moving and life-changing or some combination thereof. But what makes this event so special is that these are personal stories and that we get this rare glimpse into the, the life of a person here in our community. So thank you all for being here. And give yourselves a big round of applause for being here tonight. The story so relax, enjoy, but open up and listen to these great stories. And so we begin. We have our uh, first speaker tonight. He is the Dean of the College of Communications and Fine Arts. Please welcome Bryant Alexander. At the center of my middle finger, the finger of disgust, the finger of disdain. There is a scar. A scar where lines cross, where bone and tendons meet. It is long healed, but still sensitive. I feel it every time I shake another man's hand. You know one of those bone-crushing handshakes mm -hmm. in which a man is trying to instill a masculine will upon another? <laughs> I call it a brother's scar. <laughs> I got it from my brother Vincent, <laughs> who is the middle child of seven children, he is the third boy of five boys, and I'm the fourth. <laughs> When we were growing up, people would describe us as the flip side of the same coin. He was described as the real boy, the masculine boy, the rough and tumble boy, the particularly hyper-heterosexual boy. And I was the flip side. I was uh, not as masculine. I was not as rough and tumble, I, and I was particularly gay. And most of our lives, we fought in the social construction of what it meant to be men, what it meant to be black men, what it meant to be brothers, both biological brothers and social brothers. One day, sitting in the living room, my brother sat 
bending back and forth the wire, the wire portion of a fly swatter. And the kind of kid that I was, I said, you know, if you continue to do that, you're going to break it. <laughs> and maybe just to spite me, he broke it. And he threw it on the floor as if in spite, and he walked away. Being the kid that I was, I picked up the two pieces along with masking tape. Not to mend that which was already broken, but to try to cover the sharp edge of the one side so that it wouldn't snag anything. And my brother, recognizing what I was doing, called me a faggot and grabbed the fly swatter out of my hand, but not completely. You see, that jagged edge that I was trying to cover with a piece of masking tape became lodged right under the skin of my middle finger, the finger of disgust, the finger of disdain. And even though I cried telling him that it was lodged under my skin, he grabbed hold of it and he started running. And he ran through the living room and through the kitchen and down the hall and through the bedroom, through my parents' room, back into the living room, leaving a trail of blood and tears. My mother, hearing my screaming, immediately came and began to tend to my mom. And that was one of many brother scars <laughs> from my biological brother, but also my cultural brother. You know, those black guys, those men who consistently enforce a particular performance of black masculinity, an aggressive form of black masculinity that was directed towards either those that they desired, the women in their lives, or those that they particularly had a disdain for, the gay boys in their lives, the one who made them question the very notion of masculinity and what it meant to be a man. But this is not a story about two roads that diverged in a narrow wood and the choice that I made. But there is another story, another brother story about a different kind of spot. My brother Nathaniel, right? My brother Nathaniel, who was the third child of seven children, the uh, second boy of five boys. And I'm the fourth. And he, too, was gay, but didn't openly identify himself as gay. And he made a very particular kind of choice not to attract the kind of angst and anger and fear that he knew he would if he outed himself and that he recognized that I was actually experiencing. And later we reconcile the tensions that exist between our individual choices. But he never outed himself. He never named himself. He never claimed a particular kind of identity, a queer, black, gay identity. But he was inevitably named. You see, my brother contracted HIV AIDS and died in 1995. And then he was named by the community, right? He became that reckless black fag who didn't make a choice, that reckless black fag who didn't have a voice, who didn't have volition, and was irresponsible with his life. And that left its own scar, a psychic scar, as I was trying to articulate the nature of my identity, the nature of my black, queer, masculine, identity. But there's a way in which these two stories converge. You see, in 1995, I was a first year doctoral student. In 1995, my brother Vincent, my brother Vincent, <laughs> was in his first year of a four year prison sentence because of drug use. In 1995, I drove, I traveled the distance from graduate school to home to be a part of the funeral services to deliver the eulogy for my brother. In 1995, we received a phone call that the local prison 
would not allow would allow my brother to come and view the body from prison, but not in the company of family. It would be in the wee hours of the morning, a solitary engagement. That morning, in anticipating his visit, about 4 a.m. in the morning, I got dressed and ready for a day of funeral services, but I drove to the funeral home and I sat in my car waiting for that moment when they would bring my brother in, waiting for that moment when I could see him, if only from a distance. And sure enough, you know, the police van pulls up with police on it. And my brother comes out in a white jumpsuit with traditional black lines across it. He is chained at the wrist, he is chained at the ankles, and he is shuffling his way into the funeral home. When he comes out of the funeral home, I'm standing next to my car. And from a distance, we see each other. Through a fog of tears and hate and remembrance and regret, we see each other from a distance. About a week later, I'm back in graduate school, and I get a letter. I get a multiple page letter written on that bad, horse kind of prison stationary. And it's not really a narrative as much as that it's a single, a series of statements, a series of requests. It begins with, I'm sorry I messed up. I'm sorry I wasn't there for the family. I'm sorry I embarrass you all the time. I'm sorry I beat you up. I'm sorry I wasn't a good brother. Can you forgive me? And I do. But this is not a story about two roads diverging in a yellow woods and a choice that I made. Maybe this is a story about intersections. Maybe this is a story about intersectionality. Maybe this is a story about the complex identity construction of black men in America trying to find a way to be fully alive in themselves without the social and political critique that buys them against each other, straight, gay, whatever, who cares. My brother and I have developed a good relationship over the years as adults, as men. I've forgiven a lot, but I can't forget. Because you see, on my middle finger, the finger of disgust, the finger of disdain, there is a scar, a scar where lines cross, where bone and tendon meet. Long heel, but still sensitive. I feel it every time I shake a hand of another man. You know one of those bone-crushing handshakes in which another man attempts to inflict a masculine will on another? I feel it then. This is not a story about two roads diverging. Maybe this is a story about resistance. Maybe this is a story about bravery. Maybe this is a story about choices. Maybe it's just a story about brother scars. Speaker, she's a student here, a junior. Is that right? Yeah. You're senior, okay, excellent. She's brought her whole front row cheering <laughs> section, so good. And so please give a warm round of applause for Daisha Black. Thank you. Wow, I just want to say thank you again to Dean Bryant for sharing that impactful story with us. Well, good evening. Um, again, I am Daisha Black. I am a senior here at Loyola Marymount as a psychology major. And I am so honored to be a part of the LMU Speaks program and to have been asked to share my story with you all tonight. You know, but to be honest, when I was asked to speak and to share my story, I was like, wow, I don't really know what I'm gonna talk about. I mean, there's so many times my life has fallen off the rails and, you know, continues to get slanted here and there. 
But to give you a little bit of background, I was born in Long Beach, California, not too far from here. My brother and I, we were both raised by our incredibly strong mother. And here I'm defining strong as having the fortitude and commitment to not take no for an answer. And I remember growing up how passionate she was about education. I mean, she would do whatever was necessary to ensure academic success for her children. And while that meant wanting to put us in the best schools, even though she couldn't afford the best schools, you know, she did what any forward-thinking parent would do, and she wrote to Oprah. <laughs> yes. Believe it or not, Oprah responded and gave both my brother and I full scholarships to attend a private school. And while we started going to private school, you know, later as I reflect back on my time there, I think, wow, we were about the only two black kids on campus. But that was okay. My brother became school president. I had plenty of friends. And, you know, we really enjoyed our time there. However, when it was time for my brother to transition into high school, we both were pulled out of private school back into the public school system. And I think that, for me, was a time when life truly began to fall off the rails a little bit. You know, immediately, I'm harassed. Nothing about me makes sense to my peers. The way I speak, the way I do my hair, the music I listen to, the sports I play. And so as I'm getting harassed daily, called whitewash, things of other natures, you know, this really just caused me to question my racial identity and really struggle with who I am. And this continued all the way out through high school. And I remember graduating, right, feeling like finally I can leave this chapter of my life behind, I can move on. I had been accepted into the local college and I remember my mom being so proud, so proud. I was going to her alma mater, and I was excited. I felt like, you know, finally I get a fresh start, I get to do things differently, be who I am. Not realizing that the identities that I, and struggles with racial identity would be following very close behind. And so as a freshman, as I try to navigate my way through college campus, I decided to join a predominantly white sorority. And you know, it was, it was decent. My sister seemed nice. I remember going to a party one night, a fraternity party. And I had a generally a good time. Until the next day, my friend tells me to go look at this website. And so this website was, I guess it's like a, you can call it a blog, a blog site. It's for fraternities and sororities to post anonymously about people. And so as I'm scrolling through this site, you know, I finally come across the blog post about the black girl that doesn't belong. And this is me rephrasing it nicely. You know, to see all these comments on this page from people that I thought, you know, enjoyed my company as much as I enjoyed theirs. Here I am, this girl that likes alternative and classical rap. Matter of fact, I was raised on alternative and classical rock. My mom introduced me to Incubus, Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Hollow Notes from a very young age. <clears throat> you know, I played guitar for years, I played it well. But me being who I was didn't make sense. Me being in the spaces and places that I put myself in didn't make sense to the people around me. And so again, you know, I find myself struggling with my racial identity, struggling in class because I'm burnt out, struggling to find and keep friends, struggling to figure out what does it mean to be a woman at 18 years old and to grow up. So I decided to, uh, you know, just to drown everything out, to drown out all the noise, I turned to alcohol. And that helped for a little bit. So my mom found me one morning, passed out on her front porch at 6 a.m. She rushed me to the hospital. I had no recollection of the night before. And so here I am bringing shame and disappointment to my mom's door. You know, my life was spiraling out of control in everything.
And so, you know, as a senior here at LMU, you all might be wondering, how did I get from point A to point B, right? You know, and my answer to that is, June 14, 2012, my beautiful daughter was born. And I share this, and I don't share this lightly, but I truly believe having Tristan saved my life. When you fall off the rails, and I mean really fall off the rails, and nothing else makes sense, it takes a lot to get back on. You know, it takes self-love. It takes care. It takes support. And while I share that my daughter saved my life, and I mean that quite literally, I know there's no way I would be standing here before you all tonight if it wasn't for my faith, if it wasn't for my mentors. I'm so honored to have Dr. Williams here with us this evening, who watched me grow up, listened, and always encouraged my dreams. You know, he always believed in my ability to do something and be somebody greater. Mr. Henry Ward, who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, who continues to challenge, support, and guide me while I learn from and teach others who have gone through similar struggles that I've gone through. My amazing friends, which are more like family who I've gained through my church community, who accept my daughter and I as we are, who accept me as the imperfect person that I am and continue to encourage and be inspirations of light in our lives. And my mother. You know, words truly can't express the gratitude I have for how hard she fought to raise my brother and I. Single parent, working full time, going back to school with two kids. You know, the amount of times and the decisions I, decisions I made <coughs> broke her heart countless times. But she truly does deserve all the recognition and praise because I know that when I fall off the rails, when I have fallen, when I continue to fall, she will be right there to pick me up and tell me, like she always tells me, like she told me last night, that this too shall pass. You know, and if I can be half the woman that she is, if I can be half the mother that she is, I'll know I have done something right. Thank you. Thank you for that story. Thank you. Again, this is just the power of this night. And we should have tissues, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be so powerful. So thank you. you. Have a cocktail now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to keep it moving, we have our next speaker is also a student. She's a senior as well. Please welcome Janie McManaman. I'm sorry. Thank you again, Daisha and Team Bryant, for sharing your stories with us. They were incredibly powerful. And I'm really touched that you were willing to share them with us tonight. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Janie McManaman. I'm a senior now, double major in Women's and Gender Studies and Asian and Pacific Studies with a minor in Irish Studies. And yes, I'm going to graduate today. <laughs> No, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. But to be honest, I'm really honored to be here tonight. However, when I was told that I would be speaking about a time in my life that felt off the rails to me, I wasn't quite sure what to say. I mean, I have had more than enough off the rails moments in my life. In fact, I remember a time in fifth grade when my teacher went around the room and asked each of us to list girl jobs and boy jobs. Now, I remember this so clearly because when I gave my answer, the entire class laughed at me. 
I had said that boys can do anything girls can do, and girls can do anything boys can do. So when people started laughing, I was shocked. I was confused and hurt. I guess you could say I was a feminist in the fifth grade. <laughs> but as I got older, I learned about social issues in a broader context. I lived in a predominantly white community. I wasn't necessarily exposed to other ethnicities or cultures or religions, and oftentimes I was criticized for standing up for equity and inclusion. So I educated myself as much as I could about power dynamics, privilege, and social norms. And here's what I learned. You can't fight sexism without fighting racism, homophobia, and all the other isms out there. Now, originally I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and I am very, very proud of that. But I am not going back. <laughs> <laughs> Actually drove out here last summer and terrified my father. Um, he was like, what do you mean by yourself? Seriously? But maybe to him it was terrifying. For me, no big deal. I studied abroad before for a month in Dublin, Ireland, and last spring I studied in Osaka, Japan. Figured if I could get my way around Ireland and Japan on my own, I could drive from Cleveland to LA on my own too. Obviously, I've had some really incredible moments since I've gotten here at LMU, and when I graduate, I'm gonna miss it. A couple weeks ago, I was at the Troubadour for a concert. Typical Sunday night for me. I saw this metal band called Sharp Tooth and that night ended up being very inspiring. This band was playing songs about critical issues today, and their lead singer said something that really compelled me. She told us about a time in her life that was traumatic for her. And then she told us, I'm not sharing, with this, I'm not sharing this with you because I want you to feel bad for me. I'm saying this because somebody has to, because we have to have a conversation about these things. Every 98 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. And every year, there are an average of 321,500 survivors. One of every six women and one of every 33 men will experience an attempted or completed assault in their lifetime. When broken down by race, Native peoples are at least twice as likely as any other race to experience an assault. And transgender people of color are 1.8 times as likely. College age individuals are at a very high risk during this point in their lives. On college campuses, one of every five women and one of every 16 men will experience an attempted or completed assault. And transgender students are at an even higher risk. 90% of these survivors will not make a report, and about 70% of survivors know their assailant. In general, 63% of assaults are not reported to the police. And 99% of perpetrators walk free. These aren't all statistics, nor are they entirely inclusive. But these are statistics that are finally, finally being recognized. We are finally holding people accountable, and we are finally having a conversation that we've needed to have for a long, long time. When I first noticed that the Me Too hashtag was gaining speed, I thought it was an empowering way to reclaim a situation that so often feels out of control. But as I had more time to reflect on it, I wasn't so sure. My main concern with this was that it was put on the victims to come forward. And of course, it's not the first time a disenfranchised group has had to bear that burden, but it's still not fair. The other thing that was painful for me were all of the people who were sitting there and saying, wow, I had no idea. It's not their fault that they didn't know. But it was painful for me because this is something that we should have been seeing and understanding all along. I was worried about those who came forward and then received backlash. I was worried about those who didn't come forward and were now morally conflicted about whether they should make themselves vulnerable. And I was worried because this ignorance is so pervasive in our society that multiple women can come forward about the same assailant, and we will still elect him president. <laughs> Even before this became a movement, a hashtag, what I wanted was for people to ask what they could do. And my answer is to listen. If you ask any woman in your life if she's experienced harassment, the answer is yes. We didn't need a viral two-word campaign to know that. 
This isn't a new thing. And every person's story is valid, whether they post or not. I was also worried because now people who had posted were getting text messages asking about what happened, wanting to know what happened. And those who decided not to post were unsure if they were doing the right thing simply by doing what was healthiest for them. And all of these people didn't know who would scrutinize them or who would believe them. The other thing that was frustrating for me was that it was Tarana Burke, a black woman, who actually started this movement in 2006. It's not a new movement. Of course, that's not to say that nothing good has come of Me Too. It was Time's Person of the Year in 2017. It's gotten people to open their eyes, to become more aware, and to want to learn more. While it has its limitations, it did spark a critical conversation. The other thing that it's done is create a community of solidarity among survivors across all boards. And they could come together under a sense of understanding and empathy. And that's something a lot of survivors did not have before. Now, I don't really consider this just a time when we're holding people accountable. This is a movement toward a much more important change. I'm grateful and I'm happy because now people are listening. Now people are asking what they can do better. And now we're no longer belittling those who have come forward. Even though I was impatient about having people listen, now is better than later or never. I have faith that this can create a serious change in the way that we handle things and the way that we act to them. And I just want to say, me too. I actually know a little too well. Yeah. Uh, uh, you might know him as a professor of political science in the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts. You might know him as a special assistant to the president. I know him as the father of our two children. Please welcome <laughs> John Parrish. in a smallish town in Oklahoma at a smallish Baptist church. My family and I went there three times a week. I memorized Bible verses, I sang in the children's choir, I felt really comfortable. They told me church was God's house, which mainly seemed to mean you weren't supposed to run, but it was also my house and my second home. Let's call that period on the rails. One year, when I was maybe nine or ten, they set up in the church foyer this wire rack with an array of glossy pamphlets. An avid reader, I consumed all of them, a wide range of evangelical messages about the dangers of alcohol and premarital sex and Mormonism. Probably <laughs> Catholicism, too, come to think of it. One of them had a particularly ominous cover, a photograph of a fire consuming black logs crested gray with ash. And across the fire in bold letters, it said, the unforgivable sin. So naturally, I was going to read that. <laughs> it quoted from Mark's Gospel, where Jesus said that God will forgive any sin except one. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, he says, will not be forgiven. Now, I didn't know exactly what blaspheme meant, uh, but I did know it had something to do with cursing, and I knew cursing had something to do with bad words, because I went to elementary school. So, like the old saw, don't think of an elephant. When I say curse word, what word comes to your mind? Probably the same as left to my mind. 
followed immediately by the predicate noun, the Holy Spirit. Blank, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and in the space of five seconds, I committed the unpardonable sin, which was obviously concerning. I'm not saying I spent my whole childhood emotionally scarred because of five seconds of mental free association. After a tear-filled talk with my parents, they convinced me fairly easily that I had not, in fact, committed the sin God refused to forgive. They told me the verse in question meant that if you deny Jesus Christ, if you were told the good news, but spent your whole life not believing it, and that was blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That was the unforgivable sin, which itself sounds kind of horrifying, I recognize, but in the context, it gave us a little bit of a relief. It's all relative. It did teach me, though, that you can't take everything in the Bible at face value, and that opened a bit of a Pandora's box. Baptists supposedly believe in something called biblical inerrancy, which basically means that every statement in the Bible is true with no factual mistakes. For me, that came across as kind of a challenge. I had lots of questions. I was basically a 12-year-old version of Spencer Tracy cross-examining at the end of the third day. <laughs> And the answers I got didn't satisfy. Here's my favorite example. According to the Gospels, the week before he died, Jesus cursed a fig tree and miraculously caused it to wither. Now, I was willing to grant the miraculous bit. What do I know about fig trees? But here's what I couldn't get over. In Mark, Jesus curses the fig tree, and the next day they come back, and it's withered. But in Matthew, it withers immediately. I asked the biblical inerrancy folks about this, and their answer was, I'm not kidding, there must have been two different fig trees. <laughs> and so I forgot the first one, but it never happened the same week. That's about when I stopped listening to answers like that. But though I struggled with the content of my faith, I never stopped caring about it. On the contrary, I badly wanted to get right with God. At the end of every Baptist service, there's a time of invitation where you can come down front and take action. Four basic actions you can take. Conversion, joining the church, surrendering your life to being a preacher or a missionary, and finally rededicating your life to Christ, which is when you've strayed and now want to come clean. I don't know how many times between the ages of 12 and 16 I rededicated and I suppose re rededicated and then re, -re rededicated my life to Christ, which was a bunch. Lord knows what the folks in that church thought I was up to between the Sundays. <laughs> but I knew there was some connection to God I wanted to have that I didn't. I wanted something real. So much of my religion was starting to seem like me. In high school, I got to be good friends with a kid named Jay Gibson. He was a preacher's kid at a different Baptist church. The main source of religious diversity in Shawnee was which Baptist church you went to. <laughs> like me, he heard it all and knew the moves and still felt dissatisfied. One night, Jay shared his worry with me. God, he said, doesn't talk to me. And that was the root of the problem. In the Bible and the testimonies people shared at church, God came off as pretty doggone loquacious. God called people to be preachers, God called them to marry a certain person, or talk to a certain stranger, or get off the highway at a certain exit ramp. <laughs> Not only didn't that happen to me, I had a hard time envisioning how it could. What would it sound like? People would say, God speaks through the scriptures. That's God's word. But we've seen that there were problems with that. <laughs> so I didn't have an answer. But I did, for the first time, have a best friend who shared my predicament, my longing for the three-dimensional Christianity, no residue of me. Because Jay knew the religious game as well as I did, we could be, we had to be, more honest with each other about our struggles in faith and in life than we've been able to before. God might not be talking to me, but Jay was. And for the first time in my faith struggles, I felt a little less alone. After high school, Jay and I went our separate ways. Final week of my freshman year, around 11 in the morning, my dad called to tell me Jay had dropped dead in the shower that morning at the age of 19. His dad had a congenital heart condition, and they thought that might have been passed on to Jay, but that was as much of an explanation as I ever got. It was just one of those things, they said. God. I don't remember much about the months that followed other than the dull, hollowed out feeling I carried around with me every day. I do know the moment I realized how angry it made me. I was home for Easter and it was a Good Friday service at my church by candlelight. Near the end I started crying and when it was over I mumbled to my folks to give me a few minutes and everyone gradually filed out. Alone in the darkened sanctuary with just the moonlight streaming in through the stained glass windows, I wandered up to the balcony where I used to sneak sometimes as a kid, and I whisper screamed at the God who still didn't talk to me. 
over and over, why did you take my friend away? I remember flailing around in the pitch black, just punching and kicking and throwing a hell of a tantrum, shadow boxing with God in the night. After that, for a few years, God and I really weren't on speaking terms. It didn't last forever. I never fully got over my anger and grief, but functionally I got past it. I tried different churches in my 20s. I kept wanting to connect somehow, but I never found the clear signal I was hoping for. Then one month in the spring of 2001, I went well and truly off the grid. Naturally, I had previously entertained the idea that there might not, after all, be any God. That had been in my uh, head since I was fully informed about Santa Claus. But <laughs> thus far, I had experienced those doubts against the backdrop of a very Baptist presumption that there was a moral dimension to my doubt. It was good for me to believe, bad not to believe. Of course, that doesn't make much sense unless there's something like God in the background of doing the judging. Doubt understood implicitly as a test of faith can't ultimately be a real doubt. This was different. I can only describe it this way. For a few weeks, the full force of my imagination, 100%, was let loose, envisioning what it would be like if there really was no God. What kept going through my mind was, there's no God. Nothing I do or think can put God back in the sky. For the first time, I confronted the question of God's existence, not as a choice, but as a helpless observer. What followed was a brief stretch of existential terror. The bottom dropped out of my worldview. I dwelled obsessively on death and its finality. I felt beyond vividly the senseless sense of oblivion. I perceived the world around me perishing and dying in real time, the world's entropy expiring second by second curled up in bed, terrified to do anything but lie completely still. I can't tell you precisely when or how all that ended. Gradually it wore off. Yet forever after, the awareness persisted of what a world that really had no God would feel like. It's like those optical illusions. You look at one way, it's a face, and then again, it's two faces. One minute it's a rabbit, the next it's a duck. After that, I found myself living in a rabbit-duck universe. One I could no longer help to see is full of God's presence and at the same time is radically empty. In 2007, I made the spiritual exercises here with Sister Frances. It's basically prayer on steroids. <laughs> you commit to spend the better part of an hour every day uh, with God. I approach this anxiously. If you're at all introverted, you probably know the dread of sitting with someone and having nothing to talk about. I you know, suppose it's someone who hasn't had much to say to you for 30 years, and you're undertaking to sit silently with them for an hour each day. Imagine how you look forward to that conversation. <laughs> but I signed up. Looking back, I can see that's how bad my longing was. It was with Sister Frances, and through her, St. Ignatius, I finally began to grasp what it might mean for God to talk to me. Ignatius, it turned out, struggled with hearing God, too. And through it, he developed the rules that today we call discernment. Because if God was going to speak to you, it would have to be to your mind. And of course, God wouldn't sound like anybody in particular, Morgan Freeman or George Burns. <laughs> <laughs> you're the only voice in your head, but rather you're the ventrilo ventriloquist that has all the voices. If God was going to speak, it would have to be through you. Here's what helped me understand it better. Imagine there's a mailbox and every morning you find some letters in it suggesting how you should feel and what you should do. The messages are always in your own handwriting. Three people have a mailbox key. One is a wise and loving friend who always has good advice. One is an enemy who wants to trick you into doing what will harm you. And one is you. Coincidentally, both the wise friend and the enemy know how to Im imitate your handwriting. <laughs> also, you've been known to sleepwalk and write messages in your sleep. You can see how from the rabbit that perspective, maybe there really is a friend and an enemy, maybe they're both part of you. How could you tell who the message was from? Ignatius' answer, the short version, is you'd look at the content of the message and reason back to its likely source. You wouldn't presume to know what God was saying without having to work for it. You'd have to discern. And if you had a hard choice to make, and a voice in your head seemed to be telling you different things all at once, in the end, you just have to choose and hope that, even if you chose wrong, a wise and loving friend wouldn't give up on you. About four years ago, I started going to a new church, a really relaxed and groovy place. <laughs> <laughs> no one there is shocked you've been through a period of doubt and disbelief. They're more likely to be a little shocked if you haven't. They believe things together and say so every week, but their primary commitment is less to what they believe than the people with whom they choose to be in the community. 
That struck the chord. I began to feel like I had finally found a home. After a few weeks, I started bringing the girls with me. The first time we went down for communion, to my horror, I saw the priest, Father Peter, kneeling down to offer Sophia, then five, the bread. Depending on your upbringing, you may know my feeling of shock at seeing a child offered communion. But in the tradition I grew up in, communion is approached with great reverence, only for conscious converts. If you've ever been to Mass here and seen the non-Catholics, including me, folding their arms across their chest, you've got the idea. Eating the bread is very deliberately not for everyone. Here's the thing, though. Sophia really likes bread. <laughs> <laughs> All she knows is she likes bread and other people getting to eat the bread, and she isn't, so she's lobbying me hard. I want to. I talked with Father Peter, and he said, of course I'll respect your wishes, but I want you to know I believe strongly in offering the bread to everyone who comes forward. To me, it means this is a table where all are welcome, where everyone is offered a place. That resonated with me. It spoke to something I longed for my whole religious life, to what I wanted the gospel to be. Yet it didn't fit easily with what I believed that the bread represented the embodiment of Christ, the breaking of the bread, his crucifixion. And how could a child interact meaningfully with that? Could I even be part of this church, or was I being offered with one hand a sense of unconditional inclusion I yearned for, but at the price of trivializing what I still held sacred? I agonized over it. If you're not religious, it may be hard to understand agonizing over whether you're going to let your daughter eat a piece of bread, but I did. <laughs> The next week, I still didn't know what I was going to say to Sophia. The moment came, the music started, she looked at me, I looked at her. I wasn't trying to come up with a profound metaphor for the atonement. I was just trying to answer a question. And I heard my voice say, do you know why this we eat the bread? We eat the bread to remind us that God loves us and wants to give us everything we need. Do you think you can remember that? All right. Can you give to the Mill Valley Library Storytelling Program. Want to join me? And we sat for an hour in an auditorium in San Francisco on uh, the weekend that DOMA was passed. And we heard this presentation about what storytelling can do for a community. How it can build bridges, how it puts people in a room who don't, whose paths wouldn't normally have crossed how you learn about yourself as you hear stories from other people that help you make sense of the world. And a storyteller named Josh Healy, he's a professional storyteller, you can find him on social media. He told this story that was so compelling. And at the end, Toby Lynn and I looked at each other and said, you have to bring this to LMU. You have to do this in the library. The library is a place where people can come together from all facets of the community and learn and grow. And tonight, I feel like this was a good idea. <laughs> 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 and I just want to share my, my deep appreciation for the speakers and for Lynn, um, our MC tonight, because this was truly, truly awesome in the truest sense of the word. And then I also want to thank Toby Lynn for going with me and validating, yes, we can do this. And then I want to thank her again for going with me into a meeting room with Chris and saying, Chris, <laughs> we got a program for you. <laughs> and um, Chris knows a, a good thing when she sees it and wisely said, yes, make it happen. Write me a proposal. 
So that took me on a, a pretty much a year-long journey of putting together a committee of dedicated people who were really interested in the project. And I want to thank Jamie Hazlett for her sustained belief in me that <laughs> I have a good idea once in a while, <laughs> and um, for hiring me in the first place. <laughs> and I want to thank Stephanie Greitz for being my sounding board at the most odd and inconvenient times, particularly today. <laughs> and um, I want to thank John Jackson for making things happen the way that he does very graciously and for supporting me and um, he's my new boss, so thanks, boss. <laughs> um, and uh, who have I left out? Oh, Henry Ward, who is not here but knows that um, I, I really depend on his his many, many talents here for this community. I hear he just got the Hidden Heroes Award. And I'm very happy to learn that. Um, he he's, he's a gem. And who did I forget? Did I forget anybody on my committee? No. Lynn. Oh, yes. Lynn. Lynn is also on our, on our committee because at the end of last year's program, she really did immediately fire off an email saying, I want to be a part of this going forward. And, and I immediately fired one off saying, yes, you can be the MC. And then I went to my committee members and said, hey, do you think that it's a good idea to have <laughs> be the MC? And everybody agreed, no resistance. So lucky me. Um, and um, I want to thank my two children for being here, Josh and Eric. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your support. It means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. They listen to me talk about this program from starting tomorrow. I'll be talking about next year. <laughs> so, um, they have stamina. Um, and I want to thank um, America, my student worker, and all of you. Thank you. Thank you for being part of this. Spread the word. We'll be doing this again next year. Um, I, I think this is of value to the community, and it's certainly of value to me personally. So thank you all very much. Now, um, we're going to do a, a couple of photographs with our speakers, but stick around, get some food. There's still plenty to eat. Yep, still cream puffs. OK. <laughs> so, um, so please have something more to drink and chat with our speakers. Uh, they are going to be here in the room for a while longer and um, meet each other, greet each other. That's part of the purpose of this event, to be in a room with, path, with people whose paths you don't normally cross with and to get to know them, make a new friend. Thank you all very much. One last thing. There are feedback slips on your chair, and your feedback is important to us. So please, um, please fill out those feedback slips. You'll be entered into a drawing for a $100 Amazon gift card, which I always want to win but can't. And so if you win, I want to be your friend. They go in this uh, feedback box, or you can just leave them on your chair either way. And um, could the speakers please come forward, because we're going to do a photo. John is right there with his camera. <laughs>